So here we were uh, on page one of the uh, review problems, uh, practice set of problems, and uh, just have to look at that algebra one more time on that. Uh, let's move on to the other page though. Um, so uh, when I look at the second set of practice problems, again, this is a set of problems that came from a midterm. Um, this also has a refraction problem on it. Now, I'm not going to guarantee that there will be a refraction problem, but there's a, a pretty good chance something with refraction will be there. Uh, in any case, uh, here we have light entering a prism at point A. It refracts at A, refracts at B, and then at B it turns and takes a 90 degree angle. Now, uh, what they want us to do is find an expression that would allow us to calculate the index of refraction based on the incident angle theta. So this is similar, I guess, to that first lab that we did, right? We had that uh, minimum angle of deflection, and if you could measure that one angle, once you got everything aligned, if you could measure that one angle, then you could just, there was a formula, you just calculate the index of refraction from that. Now, I drew a picture of the setup, and uh, theta 4 is 90 degrees, so we know what that is. And then, I did a little geometry here, theta 2 and theta 3 combined are also equal to 90 degrees. Not individually, but the sum of them. And then theta 1 I just called theta, because that's how it was listed here. Now, uh, since theta 2 and theta 3 add up to 90 degrees, those two angles are complementary and I know that the sine of theta 2 is equal to the cosine of theta 3 and vice versa. So I have some trig identities that I can use, some that I should know. I know that the trig identities can become very obscure. So um, uh, I, I think there's a short list that you guys should know pretty well. You should know that uh, sine squared, cosine squared add up to 1. Um, and that uh, the sine of an angle is the cosine of its complement uh, and vice versa. A few things like that are, are pretty handy and should be pretty easy to keep track of. Uh, anyway, let me look at the first angle. So I've, I'm writing down the law of refraction and it says that uh, n1 times uh, sine of theta1 is equal to n2 times sine of theta2. Well, n1 is just air. So I dropped that. And uh, N2 is just the N value that I'm looking for, so I put that in. Then here is my other uh, refraction formula. N times the sine of 3 should equal N4 times the sine of 4. Now, the sine of 4 is 90 degrees, and the index of refraction in the air is 1. So N sine theta 3 is equal to 1. Now, uh, I just need to find a way to bridge sine theta 2 and uh, sine theta 3. And for that, what I did was uh, I did use that uh, complementary effect. And, and that's not the only way this can be solved, but it seemed easy enough to switch over and say sine theta 3 equals uh, n. Uh, sine, sine theta 3 equals cosine theta 2. And so I could make this substitution. Now, um, I took the two equations that I had ended up with and uh, squared them because I noticed that I now had a sine squared theta 2 and a cosine squared theta 2, added those together, and so I ended up with n squared is equal to 1 plus sine squared theta, and that's it. So I was able to eliminate theta 2 and theta 3 and uh, get the index of refraction formula uh, entirely in terms of theta. So you can imagine using this technique, right? Kind of like we did in lab, you get a laser out, take a sample, rotate it back and forth uh, until that just barely hits the edge, it runs along the edge, and then measure that angle. Now for this setup, it asks us how useful is this for uh, different ranges of index of refraction. And for this particular setup, uh, theta can't be any bigger than 90 degrees. It's going to be between 0 and 90. And that says that the index of refraction would need to be between 1 
and the square root of 2. So the largest that could become is 1.41. Now if we switch out this um, 90 degree angle here and make it smaller, we could use the same approach. Formula would be a little different, but we could get a formula for that and then we could use it for other indexes uh, more than what we've done here. Okay. All right, so for this setup, that would be uh, the, the possibilities. And then it just asks uh, qualitatively what happens if we take a look at this setup and we slightly increase or decrease the incident angle. Uh, what happens if theta 1 is increased a bit? Well, if theta 1 increases, theta 2 will increase, theta 3 goes down, theta 4 goes down, and that says that this, uh, this angle of refraction shifts away from the surface. And so we will have refraction taking place. At 90 degrees, we're right at the point where refraction disappears. So that's actually the effect we're looking for as we rotate this and try to find the angle at which the refracted light basically goes away, where it just barely goes away. Uh, it's, it's between skimming along the surface and then it disappears. It's no longer there. And instead, we have total internal reflection. Now, if, so if theta increases here, this is going to come out just a little bit. What happens when theta here gets smaller? Well, theta 2 is going to get smaller. Theta B3 is going to go up. Theta 4 is going to go up. But wait, theta 4 can't go up. There will no longer be any refraction. The refraction path will cease to be an option. And so we'll end up with total internal reflection in that case. All right. Any questions on that, stop by, let me know. Uh, again, make sure you're looking at other problems. Don't uh, focus just on these practice problems, although these are good to cycle through with uh, in your review. A good place to start your review uh, and then cycle back through homework and uh, lecture problems. All right, moving on to problem two on this particular midterm. Uh, we got a camera. Uh, designed using a single converging lens, that's not unusual, and the, the focal length of the lens is uh, six centimeters. Now we want the camera to be able to focus on objects from 40 centimeters out to infinity. Now those are the object distances. So the object distance, we want it to work at 40 centimeters, we want it to work at infinity, and so we want to find out first of all how far, oh no, it's the film array. I think it's supposed to say sensor array. Should the lens be placed for an object uh, at 100 meters? Now, 100 meters out is kind of the same thing as infinity. Okay, so the 100 meters is kind of that. And the film or the sensor array uh, is going to be determined from DI. So if I'm at 100 meters, that's, that's 10,000 centimeters, plugging these numbers in. Uh, to three significant figures, di is going to be 6.00 centimeters. So in this case, it's as if the object is infinitely far away and the image will show up at the focal length. So di matches the focal length in this example. Now for this example, at uh, 100 meters, what will be the magnification? How large an object will fit onto a 35 millimeter CCD array. So that's the sensors, the uh, charged coupled devices uh, for the camera. Is the image uh, erect, which is right side up, or inverted, which is, uh, is inverted upside down? Uh, is the image real or virtual? And so um, drawing the diagram here, it's a single converging lens. Uh, we've got a real object, we have to have a real image so it can land on the uh, sensor array. Uh, so we're going to get an inversion. The image is going to be real. And putting the numbers in uh, to determine magnification and uh, image height, or uh, object height, uh, we find out that the magnification is going to be really small, right? Because the image on the film is much larger than this 
landscape that you're looking at that's 100 meters away. And so we're going to get something really small for magnification. And uh, it says that the, the largest object located 100 meters away that you could uh, image and still have it fit is 58 meters. So that's a pretty good sized object that uh, this lens is going to be able to take in. All right, 58.3 meters, wow, that's, uh, that's pretty big. So uh, in part B, now what we're going to do is we're going to recalculate all those numbers, but we're going to redo those for uh, an object distance of 40 centimeters. So it's really just changing the numbers here and then going through. Uh, in this case, we find out that the image distance is a little over 7 centimeters. So in order for this camera to operate, and we've talked about this in lecture, in order for this camera to operate successfully, in order to focus at something as close as 40 centimeters away, and then also focus all the way out to infinity, the lens only has to move back and forth about, about one centimeter. So uh, the lens, you know, as you're focusing this, the lens is moved back and forth and that motion of one centimeter allows uh, this camera to provide that long, that long, long distance of, uh, that wide range of object distances. So uh, let's see, we got the image distance, we can go back and do the magnification. Now the, the magnification this time is still less than one. Uh, the image on the sensors is still smaller, but not by all that much. And it says actually in order to fit on a 35 millimeter sensor array, uh, the object can be no larger than 20 centimeters in size. So the object can only be this big if we're going to be able to fit that onto uh, the sensor. Make sure that we get, we're not cutting off any part of that uh, photo. Okay, and once again it's going to be inverted and it's going to be real. Now they didn't ask for a ray diagram here, but I feel like they should have ask for a ray diagram of what's going on. Um, so I, it, this is probably pretty straightforward. This seems, uh, seems easier than uh, the, the lens problem we had in the, on the flip side of this uh, practice set. All right, let's move on to problem three. Problem three is a two-slit experiment. Now, uh, one thing that I notice is missing uh, from both sides here is uh, diffraction. So there's nothing that's really dealing with diffraction. We do have the diffraction ratings, and we do have the two-slit and the three-slit uh, examples. Uh, yeah, so make sure that gets filled in, because you could just as easily have a problem of, as diffraction showing up as one of these two or three or four-slit examples, uh, or one of these diffraction ratings. You could have diffraction, you could have thin film, interference, so there's nothing of thin film here. Uh, you could have a problem looking at um, diffraction limit of resolution. So those are all topics that we spent a fair amount of time looking at. There are homework problems, there are examples in the lectures for those topics, and those are important topics within the course. So uh, for this, we've got two slits. A screen is 1.7 meters away, uh, the distance between the slits is 0 0.055 millimeters. That's pretty small, less than a tenth of a millimeter. And uh, we're going to work with two different wavelengths of light and look at their interference patterns. So there's a 480 nanometer source and a 600 nanometer source. Now we can think of those both going through at the same time, or we can think of them as, as being done sequentially. And uh, what we're trying to find out is uh, what's the separation of the third order bright maxima for the two interference patterns. So I'm going to use n equals 3. It's the third peak over. I'm going to write down the two wavelengths. Now the d is not going to change. And I'm going to switch units here so that the d is expressed in uh, nanometers. And I want to get my formulas out there. d sine theta equals m lambda and tan theta equals x over l. Uh, the distance of the screen is 170. I back those down to centimeters. It's just sounding to me like uh, the distances we want to measure on the screen are probably going to be centimeters, not meters. Uh, I can change that if I need to. But So 
I took a look at the n equals 3, and uh, I got the x values on the screen, uh, shown in that diagram, and it works out that the angular separation is 0.375 degrees, and that works out to be um, 0 0.00655 radians. Is that all they ask for? It is. What is the separation? Oh, they did ask for the separation. I never wrote it down. So, uh, but that's easy enough to subtract 1.12. So there's going to be a 1.12 centimeter separation between when we're using the 480 nanometer, probably kind of blue light, and the 600 nanometer, probably kind of orange light or something. Um, there's going to be a 1.12 centimeter difference in locations on the screen. And then finally in part C, it's saying draw a diagram of the experimental setup. So I, I drew the diagram here. And then it said draw a diagram showing the relative location of the light on the screen. Now, uh, I think that's it. I think this is spurious. Uh, I think someone came in and asked me another question, and I, I wrote that down onto this. I, that, that can be taken out. So that can be removed. I'll have to go in and, and get that taken out. That's, um, hmm, okay. Anyway, uh, that's to see on the midterm if this problem or something similar shows up, how many people write that picture down out of desperation. We'll, we'll see. Anyway, uh, this is all there is, I think. Draw a diagram for, yeah. Okay, that's too easy. So these problems are tending. I think the ones on the flip side were uh, better. These are almost maybe, uh, one was a little tricky. Three is pretty straightforward, and or two straightforward, and three. Now, uh, what I noticed too, once I had put these together, is that I have the same problem for on both of them. And so uh, I guess, the numbers here, are the same. Yeah, the numbers here are all the same. So I did the same thing, I did the guessing. Uh, this time, suspiciously, the guessing didn't take as long. But I got the same setup, and then, yes, I did the, uh, look at that. So I did the uh, algebra here too. So it's just kind of a duplicate of the other solution. So I guess we have seven problems uh, combined on here. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, again, I just wanted to go through some um, problems and uh, talk a little bit about uh, what uh, items to think in terms of, uh, think broadly in terms of the topics for the upcoming midterm.